Elden Ring, a video game that was just very recently rewarded with the game of the year and, and well deserved, but has completely changed the perception of open world games and what can be done with them forever. I think this game took many people by surprise. This introduced a whole new audience to FromSoft and their unique approach to game design, in which it's fundamentally a game that introduces you to unknown and seemingly impossible and immovable objects and lets you learn and figure out a way to eventually overcome those obstacles. Combine that with the spirit of the open world game approach, and this is not the typical open world design that you would likely expect. Honestly, it's an extremely bizarre concept for a game to begin with, but it works shockingly well. When the entire experience is crystallized, Elden Ring is basically an open world Dark Souls game until it's not, and I'll explain what I mean by that later in the video, but as an honorary member of the embarrassing man-child community myself, who attended college for a whole year, I am therefore required by law to make a giant video essay about Elden Ring ring, and why it's a masterpiece with some clear blemishes and imperfections. Babe, wake, wake up. New video essay on a subject I literally don't care about just dropped. The main things I really want to focus on are the game structure and how the open world interacts with the player and therefore the world, a little bit of the storytelling, and also how the combat and, and how builds play a role in the experience, and of course, the bread and butter of FromSoft games, the bosses. Keep in mind, I'm not going to talk about every single boss in this game, as there are just far too many, but I am going to talk about the most noteworthy of them, or any others that I actually have something to say about, and all the bosses that I discuss will have their own dedicated sections as well. With all of that said, Elden Ring is easily one of my favorite games of all time. Its fundamentals are super solid, despite this weird and brand new spin on a formula, and despite all its problems, I truly think that this will be one of the games that defines a generation. Mark my words, I only think Elden Ring is going to get looked at more and more fondly as time passes, but in some sense, I think all of that is justified. It's a wonderful example that games are still being massively innovative in current day. I know it's easy to get into the mindset that games don't innovate or push boundaries anymore, but Elden Ring proves that that is not the case in Flying Colors. Having said that, no game is ever truly perfect, and as I always say, you don't even really want a perfect game either, because then we'd have nothing to complain about endlessly on the the internet, but on a more serious note, my critiques and criticisms of certain components of the game are born out of a passion for the experience and how it might be made better. So we're going to cover it all, the good, the bad, and the terrible all the same. So if you want to hear a guy in his mid-twenties make a video essay on a game he really loves, then get comfortable and join me as we dive into the experience that is Elden Ring. Let me be honest with you right out of the gate and set the stage here. This is a personal opinion of mine, but I've never been the biggest fan of open world style games. I don't have anything against them at all, and I've played countless versions of slightly different flavors of the open world format, but nothing was really quite doing it for me. Never was really big on the open world gameplay of Assassin's Creed or Uncharted with its open world elements, No Man's Sky wasn't really my vibe, and maybe this is blasphemous to say, but I really didn't enjoy Breath of the Wild all that much. On the contrary, I had a great time with all of the other more linear Zelda games before, but something about how open world was handled in video games up to this point just didn't really have me bricked in the way that it probably should. Let me be clear, those all the games I just mentioned are wonderful video games, but subjectively, the open world wasn't really doing it for me. Then Elden Ring came along and completely redefined what the buzzword open world really meant to me. But you may ask, what's the difference? I'll explore that in detail later in a moment, but I want to say that the open-ended structure is its greatest asset and biggest liability. The way the game's built is such a double-edged sword and in, in some cases, that is literally true. The positive element is that the game is so expansive that you'll never feel you've really mastered it all or have seen every inch of what it has to offer. There's always something you probably haven't encountered, and that keeps the game interesting and exciting. On the other hand, this also means that every player is likely going to have a largely different experience to someone else. Your entire perception of this game is pretty much determined by how you choose to interact with it. Again, that is one of its biggest strengths. It's incredibly rewarding to feel like you accomplish something without the game throwing you freebies and really having agency over how the game plays out. And you can go about doing that in virtually unlimited ways. 
but the downside is you're almost guaranteed to miss huge swaths of, of the game if you're not going out of your way to you know look stuff up or really take your time exploring everything like in god of war as an example well you'll have a slightly different experience depending on what you do ultimately you have to hit the same main beats as everyone else there's much less variation in experience from person to person you might go about it slightly differently but your overall experience is going to be pretty similar to most people's Elden Ring is the exact opposite. So, for example, my first ever playthrough of this game, I deliberately avoided watching any videos or looking stuff up. Totally blind experience, and it was awesome going at it like that, don't get me wrong, but I missed so much important stuff that I was on the very edge of, but didn't experience because the game is just so damn big. And I, I, I didn't even know Renala's boss fight existed at all until after I beat the game. This is like the third main boss you're supposed to encounter, and I missed it entirely. To some degree, that's probably my fault, but I also think that's the open world structure working against itself counterintuitively, and that can, you know, cause these large discrepancies in, like, subjective enjoyment, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I, the point is, the open world Elden Ring is distinct for comes with some real advantages and drawbacks. I think the strongest case for the open world design is shown in the early to mid game. You know, everything from Limgrave to to Liernia, Kaelid, and possibly even up to Altus Plateau, this is where the game shines the like the most, in my opinion. There was a lot of attention to detail about how the player is likely going to interact with the actual game for the first few hours outside of the predetermined little intro bit. A first time player is likely going to step outside, have an encounter with the tree sentinel and get absolutely blown up if you're not expecting it. And this tells you two things. Number one, you're not as strong as you think you are. And two, there are smaller fish to fry before you go and try this again. The game gently guides you along to find more gray spots and slowly introduces you to new mechanics for progression. For FromSoft has always been a little bit opaque when describing how things are supposed to work, but most players grasp the ideas and concepts pretty quickly. You can kill enemies, get stuff, and turn that stuff into runes or usable equipment to get stronger. And after watching some of my real-life, like, non-hardcore gamer friends play this, I believe what works is that it shows you just what you need to know, but makes a real point to not hold your hand at any time, despite being an open-world game. One of the best things about Elden Ring's open world format is that there are no objective markers. Again, as much as I like God of War, the thing that discouraged me from exploring much of its side content was the fact that the main objective was always telling you where you're supposed to be and it was always on screen. Not only did it feel a little handholdy at times, but it also subconsciously made exploring the other stuff feel a little pointless or boring or a little inconvenient because you know the good stuff the game has to offer is just staring you in the face. Which, look, there's a time and place for that for sure. God of War is a very accessible game and that is to be celebrated, but I'm not gonna lie, it was so refreshing having a game where it's not constantly telling me what I need to be doing. In fact, there are virtually no objective markers in the game, period. There's arguably, you know, a couple, there's one or two, like, or like after you beat Radon, it, there's one showing you that a new area was unlocked in. You should probably check it out, but nowhere on screen does it outright tell you that. The game gently funnels you, you know, into the initial natural progression that they intended. For example, you've fought in Limgrave for a while, you've explored a good chunk of it, and maybe you're feeling a little bit confident in that you've mastered it all. And because of its relative position, it's very likely that a new player at some point is going to stumble into the nightmare hellscape world that is Kaled, aka Florida. If you end up here as a low-level player, you're swiftly slapped in the face and your ego down with it. The game is showing you you're not ready for this, come back later, but in the back of your mind, you now have realized that there's a whole new world just waiting to be explored when you're a little bit farther along. And at some point in your early journey, you're also likely going to encounter the first real boss, Margaret the Fell Omen. Emboldened by the flame of ambition. And if Florida made you feel insignificant, Margaret makes you feel like dust. Unless you've already practiced the fight or know how it works, Margit was literally made to smack down players that haven't thoroughly enough explored the world yet. Margit's a great checkpoint for making sure that you've interacted with the game enough just to understand the basics and you've leveled up a bit, maybe cleared some dungeons, or killed that damn tree sentinel that was giving you hell before, and so on. I think everything from Limgrave past Stormhill Shack and up until you beat Godric, the way the open world flows and how it relates to your progression is so beautifully crafted, super meticulous and, and well thought out. 
After you get to Liurnia though, the game opens up to you a little bit, but this also means that the more careful and thought out craft of the experience starts to fade away. This is the point where a player's experience is likely going to diverge greatly from others. And if there's something I really want to drive home in this video, it's this. Due to the nature of the RPG elements that different builds provide and how, you know, they interact with main parts of the game and the additional options of like summons and boss fights, etc., it's impossible for FromSoft to design a game that's optimal for every combination of gear and playstyle that somebody might want to approach with. This means that there's this zone of optimal progression that ensures you'll have a pretty good experience, but anything on the fringes or really vastly different methods and playstyles will cause these massive discrepancies in player experience. This is the main reason that not having a difficulty slider works, because in some sense, the difficulty options are baked within the mechanics of the game and how you choose to engage with them. In short, literally everyone's going to have a different experience with Elden Ring, for better or for worse. So while I don't claim the game is perfect, I do think FromSoft does an excellent job at accounting for the relative scale of their game for the most part. Before we begin, allow me to paint you the full picture. Now, before we continue talking about gameplay and the open world structure, I want to quickly touch on story and narrative. One pretty common complaint about Elden Ring I will hear is that from a story perspective, the game is disjointed, weak, and not very interesting. And while I disagree with that sentiment, it is a valid criticism. I'm going to use God of War as an example again, since I basically played these two games side by side. God of War also literally won the award for best narrative. And again, I don't disagree with it. God of War has an excellent story, but the difference between God of War in Elden Ring story is not how much you know is or isn't there it's the method of delivery that's totally different between these two titles God of War's narrative is very straightforward and it's excellent at what it does it's a traditional three-act structure with you know a clear beginning middle and end has classic story beats that you'd expect and has a satisfactory ending there's lots of cutscenes tons of character dialogue and interactions and it's an interactive movie in some sense not even saying that's a bad thing in that case specifically because it's so so well done. Elden Ring, however, its storytelling is done through details in the world. FromSoft slapped the homie George R.R. Martin's name on this project, knowing full well people are familiar with his other work like Game of Thrones, etc., but the extent that he was involved in the storytelling is questionable at best. He seems so disconnected from the final product of Elden Ring when you hear him talk about it. I played some video games. I'm not a big video gamer. The game is called The Elden Ring, and it's a, a sequel to a uh, a video game that came out a few years ago called Dark Souls. My work on it was actually done years ago. Huh? You can definitely feel the George R. R. Martin influence smeared all over this game, but the depth in the lore that it reaches is kind of debatable, so I'm not even going to pretend to be an expert on the subject, but Elden Ring has a fairly deep lore, and knowing the basic backstory will enhance your gameplay experience tremendously. The key thing is, the story is told through small bits and clues throughout your journey. You really got to go digging for it. It's there, just waiting to be uncovered, which, you know, that's pretty much the attitude that the rest of the game takes on. I love this method of storytelling in the proper context. It reminds me very much of like old school COD zombies in a way where it's got an unbelievably deep and intricate story, but you're only given parts of it, you know, through radio messages that you'll discover occasionally or a cipher that need to be that needs to be decoded or just subtle details about the environment that will get you speculating. That's exactly the principle on which Elden Ring operates on. If you're really curious and intrigued by the narrative, then you'll uncover some clues that, you know, will unlike in the story that isn't so obvious to the casual observer. In fact, you might even just miss main key characters entirely if you're not paying attention, like Alexander the Jar. You don't necessarily need to interact with very many people at all, just like gamers do in real life. But my ultimate point is, one method of storytelling isn't superior to the other, they're just different. There's times where I like a more straightforward and crafted story to get invested in, and then there's other times where I prefer the show-don't-tell approach as well. That's why I don't even really find it useful to compare the story of God of War or any other traditional story game to Elden Ring. They're not the same, and they're not trying to be. It's really a matter of taste and personal preference at the end of the day, but the last thing I want to say about story, because it's not really 
totally my focus for why I wanted to make this video. Your experience can be totally altered when you know generally what's going on and why. It gives purpose to the enemies you fight in places you visit. While Elden Ring narratively on a surface level does come across as kind of disconnected nonsense, the pieces to put the general picture together are there if you go out of your way to look for it. It can really help you appreciate the world and events that much more if you choose to do so. The Fallen Leaves tell a story. You want to do something crazy right now? Hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying the video. We're trying to hit a million runes on this channel. You know, one sub equals one rune, and we're really trying to level up. So if y'all want to help out, it's greatly appreciated, and thank you so much. So back to the gameplay, I've realized that Elden Ring is more or less divided into three acts, just like any other game, but it's done in a much less obvious way. I really see the first act as the intro bit throughout all of Limgrave and possibly up until you beat Renala or maybe even Radon. The second act is the meat and potatoes of Elden Ring's gameplay and where the core gameplay loop is the most expansive and obvious. This covers everything from Liurnia to Volcano Manor, Altus Plateau, the capital, the snow areas, and so on. The third act of the game, the entire open world concept just falls out. The game takes a super hard shift in design and structure, but we're going to talk about more of that later. But shall we say the main bread and butter of Elden Ring specifically and what makes that unique is essentially all done in the first and second act. This is where you get the most accelerated character progression and exploration. One of the aspects that makes Elden Ring's open world so unique is the fact that it genuinely doesn't care about how much of the game you do or do not see. There's always this feeling in the back of my mind in most open world games that while it gives you the appearance of a true freeform layout, there are subtle tricks and design choices that will lead you to one spot or another. Elden Ring has some of these for sure. We, you know, some of the lighting that leads you towards dungeons and other areas, contrasts and colors to show you like golden trees and so on, but really how much of the game you interact with is totally up to you at the end of the day. This is shown very apparently in the game's dozens of dungeons and secret caves and other areas. While this massive array of places to go and do is a good thing, it also has the drawback of feeling repetitive or monotonous if examined too much. For example, Miyazaki fully intended that most players will not go out of their way to explore every area of the map inch by inch. You are literally not supposed to even. I believe the main idea behind the design here is that the average player is going to run to a very normal amount, giving them challenges and tons of enemy variety, but when taken to its extremes and exploring every area, you realize how much content is copy-pasted into one another. However, I will say I think that's largely a problem for more hardcore players only, and I'm considering you watching this video a hardcore player in this case. I'm saying the average player isn't someone who even really goes out of their way to watch YouTube videos and stuff. You know, for the normal gamer who's just going to pick up and play occasionally, this formula works almost perfectly, but any more dedicated players like us will start to see the copy-paste really take a toll on the overall quality of the game. Bosses getting cheaply, you know, turned over and easily reused in dungeons again and again can start to lose the charm they once had. Doing too many dungeons in the early or mid game can also dampen the late game experience. You might encounter a boss in a less serious encounter before you fight the mandatory one, but more importantly, this non-structure has huge implications on the main meat of the game. At the point where the game really lets you on your own, it's very common that you'll end up at some of the main bosses eventually being absurdly overleveled and just demolish them without a second thought, or fight bosses in which you're so unbelievably underleveled that you're getting consistently one-shot by almost all their moves. It's a very common occurrence. Now, you might say this is a good thing, as it rewards players who deliberately do more exploration and come better prepared, and that's fair enough as an argument. However, it doesn't account for the fact that there's, again, this zone of optimal challenge that FromSoft would generally like you to have with these bosses, since they are essentially the main content of the game. So spoiling main content for the sake of side content is really the issue we face here, and the deeper you go, the more intense this problem becomes. This and the fact that some areas require you to solve puzzles to access or or just in downright weird places the game is practically screaming at you that you're not supposed to scour every inch of the map as you play and that the goal is still the same whether you're over leveled or not the core gameplay loop is essentially defeating enemies gathering items and enhancing them at a central hub aka the round table area on your journey in the lands between you know you might do some puzzles your kill life a literally summer ants along the way is as valuable as a summer ant a stop at some shops and 
this is where you're likely to have some of the most enjoyment out of Elden Ring. The feeling of progressing your character and how that reflects in the world, you can tangibly see yourself getting stronger, and the enemies you encounter is very clearly shown. You might level up a bit and go back and completely decimate a mini boss that was giving you a lot of issues before and, and stuff like that, but Elden Ring is so loose in this aspect as to how you approach it. However, another drawback to all this is the redundancy of the dungeon layouts themselves and the rewards you get. Mostly, all the dungeons in Elden Ring consist of more or less different flavors of this general outline. You might have an odd puzzle here and there sometimes, but the majority of these, the you know stone tomb aesthetic, is pretty much all the same. And the objective is to find and turn a lever to unlock the boss fight is virtually all similar across every dungeon. Worse yet, most of the time, because of the huge number of these places, the odds that you get an item that's actually relevant to your build is almost zero. Not only that, but it's probably inaccessible for the rest of your playthrough. Sure, you can sell these things, but it hardly feels worth it considering the time required to clear the dungeons and obtain said item. Now, occasionally a dungeon will do something you don't expect, like, for example, the Mount Gelmir Hero's Grave. This is essentially one giant meticulous puzzle that is so different from all, all the others that is a great refresher, or some may take you to a completely new area of the map upon completing them and coming out the other side, something totally unexpected, and there's there's absolutely something to be said for that. All in all, these dungeons and the repetitive nature of them may eventually start to wear on you a little bit, especially if they're interconnected with side quests, which is another aspect of the game I don't particularly love. While some are better than others, side quests for characters uh, can often be just a vague description of where to go and what to do, and unless you look them up, they often end in you forgetting about what you were supposed to do and just carrying on about, you know, your, your typical day. A few of the quest lines are more or less required to access certain parts of the game like Mogu and Palace and whatnot, with just how big the game really is, it can make quest lines a bit of a nightmare if they become disorganized, or if you accidentally kill off an NPC you didn't know you needed or something like that, it can get kind of messy. While they're by no means required to beat the game, a few of the quest lines are so chore-like that I'd actually rather do my laundry and clean the dishes in real life than do some of these. Now, the big thing that sets Elden Ring and FromSoft games apart from a typical adventure open world thing like this is their handling of combat, and Elden Ring's combat pacing is usually really solid, but not without its faults either. This will become more clear when we get into bosses, but the combat pacing of Elden Ring I'd say is most similar to Dark Souls 3. The core combat of these games have generally sped up over the years, but the core idea has always been about like finding gaps in your opponent's strategy and punishing vulnerable windows when they're open, but the interesting thing is in Elden Ring, because of the huge variety in builds and weapons and the ways that these can be used, there's a lot of discrepancy in mismatch when it comes to some encounters. This means people may have really good or really bad experience with some particular bosses. I noticed this very clearly upon repeat playthroughs. There are certain enemies and bosses where the pacing of the player feels like it's from a totally different game and therefore set of rules compared to said boss. And occasionally this can have the effect where it feels like you have to wait for an enemy to make like five or six moves before you can push any buttons. While it's a mixed bag, I have to say most of the fights in Elden Ring really do feel fair, much like a reactive give and take kind of dance where you can feel engaged in that flow state as you learn and respond to moves, and other times, it just feels like you're kind of baiting an AI to spam the same moves over and over again, so you can get in one hit and just repeating the process until the health bar reaches zero. Much less engaging and way more autopilot-y. We'll come back to combat more thoroughly once we get to bosses in more detail, and also how build variety interacts with that as well, and even just every other aspect of the game, but now I do want to mention how each area of the game feels and plays distinctly different. This is a massive compliment to the world building and art direction. Somehow, they managed to make like, I don't know, 9 or 10 different spaces and playstyles feel and play completely differently from each other, including the underground areas and secret sections. The color palette and music tracks alongside its visuals give every area a really strong sense of identity. While you might say the variety in enemy types and dungeon layouts can get slightly repetitive, the aesthetic quality of each playable area make the game feel totally novel and really fresh every so often. The sheer style and vibe of everything that you interact with is such a large part of what make this massive game not tiresome or boring to play. Volcano Manor, Mogul and Palace, Kalid, all the underground 
areas and Altus Plateau are some of the most impressive and pleasing things to look at in all of gaming. And that and the potential puzzles and shortcuts baked into them, like the medallions you can build and bridges to get around on more effectively, the only region in the game that I feel is a little underdeveloped from a design and artistic standpoint is the mountaintop of the giant snowy area and the secret consecrated snowfield region. These feel significantly more spacey and empty compared to the prior locations. Altus Plateau suffers from this problem a little bit, but not as bad as this snowy area. Even the enemies are almost all borrowed from other areas of the game, making this one feel a little bit less special and distinct. Besides a couple of, you know, really key moments here and there, like the giant Game of Thrones wall or this, this massive chain that connecting these two spaces that's visually a treat, but for some reason, this entire snow region is the most uninteresting part of the game visually and otherwise by a mile, and it's right at the end of the second act of the game. And it's ironic because the part where Elden Ring stops being open world is actually where the open world itself is the most lifeless. After defeating the main boss here, there is a hard shift in Elden Ring's gameplay. By this point, you've done basically all of the main map areas, defeated several bosses, explored vast and unique areas, and covered a lot of ground in doing so. There will be tons of sites of grace on your map, and you'll have a pretty solid grasp on the open world's overall functions. Then, after burning the Earth Tree and coming to the crumbling far Missoula, Elden Ring structurally becomes more a traditional Souls game as far as layout. What you'll notice right away is two things. Number one, that the area is significantly smaller. There's way fewer sites of grace than before, and the dungeon and ever jail exploring is totally gone. And second, there's a massive difficulty spike here that's way more dramatic than any other region transition. It's a giant equalizer, and because it's way more linear from this point onwards, if you are for some reason underleveled or ill-prepared for this part, you'll know right away. And in a roundabout way, the last act of the game kind of feels like the beginning in the sense that your encounters are going to be far more consistent again. Bosses have a very particular order too, so it's hard to really be over or under leveled dramatically from boss to boss like you were maybe earlier in the game. The problem here, as far as I can tell, is not the difficulty increase per se, more that the time between hard battles is almost zero. You go through the absolute gauntlet of some of the most trying and difficult bosses in Elden Ring in a span of like, I don't know, a couple of hours when maybe that time to fa face that kind of boss frequency may have been a couple of days prior. And the last act of the game is just a very awkwardly paced segment. That, and it's maybe even borderline exhausting depending on how many fights you decide to do back to back. Like, even if you do non-mandatory fights in the more open world regions, the frequency at which you encounter them is still way lower than the late game of Elden ring. You essentially get the Godskin duo, immediately followed by the tree sentinel on the bridge, then the beast clergyman that turns into Malekith, right after you fight Sir Gideon Ofnir, followed immediately by Godfrey first Elden Lord, then Horalu, then literally Radagon and Elden Beast directly after, and possibly even Melenius somewhere in that mix. I understand why they did this though, they had to catalyze the late game into something approximating a consistent path. You know, whether you're in any of the late game regions, you're, you're getting the last materials to upgrade your weapons like ancient smithing stones and whatnot, they sort of expect your progression to be completed here roughly besides leveling up occasionally through runes at a certain point. I get the game has to come to a close somewhere, but this last part I feel is like so rushed, you don't even really get to appreciate the world as it is now with the Erd Tree burning and how that changes the entire world of Elden Ring and how it's totally altered. I do really like the third act of the game for the most part. All I'm saying is it's kind of strangely paced, especially when you're so used to being hyper exploratory from the past, you know, 90% of the game. It's a very strange design to the late game, but it is still pretty fun in its own right. It is worth mentioning that even though the game does end here when it comes to the final boss encounter and ending cinematic, Elden Ring does still allow you to go back and explore the world after or fight any bosses that you may have missed. Granted, you'll probably be way out leveled for most of them at this point, but the option is always there. Now, I know what everyone's waiting for. How do I feel about the bosses in Elden Ring? This is debatably the entire crux of the game when boiled down, and in some sense, people would argue the reason to buy the game. And I have a lot of words to say about some of these. Some of the bosses are genuinely amazing and masterclasses in terms of fun, enjoyment, and design. And some are so poorly executed that it makes the garbage pile sitting in my trash can look good. So with that said, let's talk about the bosses in Elden Ring.
Margaret the Fell Omen is most likely the first real roadblock the average player will face. And again, without knowing the boss beforehand, Margaret is absolutely brutal for an early game boss. Not only are his moves really tricky to deal with, I, I, I even think the stage you fight him on is kind of rough. Sure, it's small and easy to understand, so there's not a bunch of room variables you need to pay attention to, but it's so common to fall off the edges during Margaret's fight. In fact, before he was patched, Margaret himself could fall off this edge Edge, instantly clearing the boss encounter, but assuming you're facing him normally, how does Margaret hold up? His biggest strength as a boss is the fact that he feels almost impossible to beat initially, but you eventually learn his behaviors with enough tries. His moves don't do colossal damage by any means, but trying to punish the wrong moves or being a little bit off in your spacing or timing can end up in you getting completely spanked. I also believe Margaret does a great job at teaching the player the basics of boss fights per se. You learn to employ all kinds of evasion tactics, whether it be running away, rolling, or jumping, and you get the panic roll behavior beaten out of you pretty quickly. Albeit done in kind of a cheap way, one of my biggest issues with Margaret, you know, he's well known for the odd timing of his moves, but they feel so artificial and just like, I don't know, manufactured sometimes. His movement is so unnatural and random for the sole purpose of catching you slipping. This goes for, you know, quite a few bosses of Elden Ring, but the wind-up and build-up of a few of these animations that the, the moves have, they feel so ridiculous and absurd. You know, like in a cartoon where a character will wind up and spin their fist around really fast before punching someone hard? That's kind of the best way to describe how some Elden Ring's bosses' moves feel. But it's done in that way, not because it adds anything genuinely difficult or natural to the fight, but because it throws a wrench of random into the situation when you're learning it, rather than it just being a more natural and reactive feeling kind of pace. That's really the only big issue that I have with Margaret, besides a few animations that are hella jank that it looks like you can punish but cannot, I think Margaret is a genuinely good starter boss. It teaches brand new players what they need to know going forward, and for the most part he's fun, fair, and a good challenge every time you take him on, whether in a brand new game or in New Game Plus. All right, I'm gonna say this right here, right now, in front of the whole internet chat room. I think Godric the Grafted, in my opinion, is, you know, he's the second main boss you encounter, and I think he's actually one of the better ones in the game by a long shot. He's a pretty intriguing boss visually, and it's the first time we see somebody in Elden Ring have a first phase and second phase to their fight. He's very intuitive in terms of how his animations and timings work. It's a lot unlike Margit, where a lot of those feel unnatural. Godric Phase 1 has pretty telegraphed and straightforward moves to learn and react to. His combo strings can feel like they're a bit longer than Margaret's. He's got some different variations of them, so naturally you learn to either run away from them more and use the larger room to your advantage since there's that much more playable space. And again, the timings feel so fluid and responsive, really except this tornado axe wind move and then the fire version of that in phase two. That's pretty much the only move I, I'm not in love with. I mentioned earlier that his combo strings have a lot of paths in which they can go, so this means that the fight never gets too repetitive or like muscle memory dependent. His phase 2 moves can be a little controversial, but in general I like the switch up the dragon arm provides. I don't love every element of it, but it gives you a little more incentive to kind of get aggressive and stay closer to him so that he doesn't just keep boxing you out with ranged attacks and, and fire moves. He might take you a good few tries to get the hang of and learn the way that his phase 1 and 2 actually, you know, the moves that differ and operates, but once it clicks, this is a super fun boss and mechanically sound as well. I think he's a little easier than Margit, and maybe that's due to the nature of his actual design, or maybe it's the player feeling a little more comfortable and skilled, or I, I don't really know, but my only real issue is, this is going to sound petty, but the only thing holding back the Godric fight in my eyes is the atmosphere. While it's Stormvale Castle, you know, just generally what the visual, you know, style looks like, to me it's not different enough from Margit's fight to feel that it's like meaningfully something else, but his design otherwise, visually and mechanically, feels really balanced and finely tuned and I think it's a very memorable encounter for sure. Now, Leone Misbegotten is absolutely not a mandatory fight, but I did want to mention it. So, exploring Castle Morn, you encounter this very aggressive and fast boss wielding a sword, and it drops the weapon that I wanted to use for my Giga Chad Strength melee build, but while this fight at first can be incredibly frustrating, it seems like he just doesn't stop swinging, and the timings on his moves can be a little unpredictable and disjointed, and his range is surprisingly good for a sword user along with his aggressive speed. It feels like this fight just suffocates 
suffocates you sometimes and genuinely feels impossible without the right tactic. This causes you to play more safe and passive, which is the wrong approach with him. You kind of have to fight his aggression with more aggression of your own, since he can be quite easily hit stunned. This boss teaches you that your general playstyle will have to adapt regardless of what the boss is or what it can do and what your build is capable of. You'll need to be flexible in how you can pace yourself in combat. My main issue with Leone Misbegotten is despite knowing all that, it still feels like Homeboy just pushes an absurd amount of buttons before you even have the chance to retaliate sometimes and get anything started. When we were talking about combat pacing earlier, to me this feels like a good example of like, you know, in Elden Ring you can't move fast enough, you don't have enough resources resources and you can't act on those fast enough to be able to respond with anything before he's done attacking. It can be downright infuriating at times, but it's definitely doable with the right approach and well-placed aggression. I'm not in love with the play space of this location either. It's not that it's too small, I just don't like all the like the small random obstacles that are in the way, especially and they can be very annoying in this fight when navigating around such sweeping hitboxes. That's really about it. I think it's a pretty average to good-ish fight in Elden Ring if you ask me, but nothing like extremely top tier. I also want to quickly touch on Renala's boss fight since I completely missed it my first time around. Admittedly, I don't have that much to say about this fight other than it's conceptually very unique. So this is the first fight where you need to meet some kind of precondition before you deal damage to the actual boss. And like Margit, if you don't already know what you're doing, it can take you by surprise if you're not really paying attention. She spawns a bunch of like COD zombies crawlers that are all yapping away while you need to find and kill one specific yellow glowing one a couple of times and doing this will break her shield and lower her to the ground where she becomes vulnerable. After defeating her in this stage, she has a second form in which the room completely changes to this like really cool liminal space looking infinity ocean where it's just you, her, and the moon. Aesthetically one of the coolest fights in the game, but mechanically nothing too complex or anything to write home about. She tends towards heavy magic attacks and that can be pretty easily avoided and she's also quite vulnerable to damage. Renala is not a super super difficult fight, nor is she like crazy memorable for her mechanics, but the atmosphere alone makes this boss fight worth pursuing in my opinion. And it's also worth noting that Renala does let you reset stats or change your entire build mid game if you want to. It's a weird mechanic this late in the game, but I suppose it's kind of neat to do. Now, the Magma Worm is a completely optional boss fight in Elden Ring, but the weird part is, you're likely gonna encounter him first in a small dungeon in Kaled, just as regular Magma Worm, before you actually find the real, like, original one, or at least I did multiple times anyways, and that can kinda dampen his impact. The boss is more a visual spectacle with one lesson, rather than some kind of intricate boss. You learn pretty quickly that the Magma Worm can be heavily damaged when striking the head, more so than the body, but sticking too close to the head is where you're really in its threat range and most of the devastating attacks come from. He looks a lot scarier than he really is, but it's a good fight to give the player, you know, something that really lets them feel how much progress they've made so far and everything they've overcome. I will admit it's kind of annoying how many times this boss gets reused and repeated in different areas. It really detracts from the charm and specialness that the first one is supposed to have. It's a somewhat one-dimensional boss mechanically speaking, but I, I guess it's a nice softball that they throw you before some of the really tough ones hit you later in the game. Next up is the big man himself, Star Scourge Radon. This is a fight that really defines what Elden Ring is and genuinely has some of the coolest visuals, atmosphere, and mechanics of any boss fight. You can absolutely do this one solo, but the fight is clearly meant thematically for you to summon your allies and charge at him from across this massive battlefield. This is the biggest playable boss space in Elden Ring, maybe besides Fire Giant, and it's kind of necessary necessary both from a thematic perspective and just practically. Radon is a very active boss and he kind of has like you know, three phases, or I guess he has like one, phase one, 1 1.5, and then phase two. So he's he's very different, and he moves around quite frequently. And his moves are pretty damn powerful. In fact, Radon got nerfed in a, in a patch shortly after the game came out. Radon still got it all, however. He's fast, powerful, got quick acting moves, and a couple of like wild gimmick moves that could one-shot you if you're not being careful. However, he is very vulnerable to punishes once you understand his entire threat range and cooldown on his moves, which can take some time. He's sort of the opposite of Magma Worm, where it's not as dangerous as he looks, but Radon is as dangerous as he appears to be. One flaw, in my opinion, though, is that this fight can be really suboptimal for melee-based builds, especially considering how erratic he moves and his really large hitbox. 
boxes. So to counteract this, you do get access to Torrent throughout this fight, which is one of the few times you actually get to utilize him in a boss fight in Elden Ring, period. Radon is one of the most iconic boss fights in the entire game. Its buildup is just so unforgettable since it's like this big ritual and ceremony that prepares for it. You get to see the battlefield with like out any enemies. It's, it's very different and the lead up of this just makes it so grandiose and important feeling. It also opens up an entire new area of the map once he's defeated. Radon is not my favorite boss in the game personally, but he's definitely one of them. He's extremely high tier for me in the context of all the rest. Originally, I wasn't going to include him in this video, but I actually do want to discuss Elmer of the Briar. He's kind of out of the way to find, and it's interesting at first because you expect that he's a sortie, you know, you just find openings and punish accordingly, and just keep out of his threat range, but then y you quickly find out that don't work because he literally starts throwing his sword around the room with magic and the room isn't that big to begin with so you don't have many choices it's dangerous to be far away and up close but you learn the tactic more or less is to get in between him and his sword for the biggest punishes he's not the most memorable boss or anything but he challenges you in a way in which you he, you kind of have to forget everything you thought you knew about sword users in Elden Ring so far it's a fun one to do and it's actually one of the more like underrated bosses in my opinion but we finally make it to Rykard, Lord of Blasphemy, aka Lord of Riz. I think Rykard is visually one of the most special and unique bosses in Elden Ring, but also this is a gimmick fight to some degree, and the weapon you get for this fight only works in this particular encounter. As much as I love Rykard thematically and even the gimmick weapon behind it, I can't honestly say that this one is flawless. Just like many others, Rykard has two phases. In phase one, most of Rykard's moves feel fair and pretty reasonable. You know, they, they are very snappy, but you get used to them at a certain point. The only one that I do not like in this fight is this ground wave that was consistently one-shotting me and as far as I can tell there's actually no way to avoid this move it's guaranteed damage even if you roll you still lose like half health so this move was an absolute nightmare for me to deal with and revealed to me that I was absurdly under leveled also the arena is somewhat clunky there's times where the boss can get so aggressive that it pushes itself up against the literal spawn door wall it just trapping me in it and I was actually unable to move but aside from a few bad mechanics phase one feels pretty fun and fair it's phase two that I think has a bunch of missteps Rykard gets his sword this time and because the scale of this enemy sometimes it's really difficult to track the path of his sword especially considering he has quite a long and unnatural wind up on this move as well but the worst thing by far in this fight are these red skulls that he spawns this wouldn't be so bad if they didn't track so heavily and you could maneuver these a little bit more or you didn't have to burn so many resources in order to avoid them it's like you have two choices you either you know just eat the damage or you run out of stamina and then get hit with the sword since Rykard can keep pushing buttons even after all of these skulls are in play and they take forever to finally subside with how long the wind up on the serpent hunter weapon can really take it's almost a death sentence to get hit by even just one of these skulls despite all that I really like this this fight for the most part the premise and visuals are spectacular and even though it's kind of a gimmicky fight and it has some really jank mechanics it doesn't feel like the game is giving you a free win necessarily either just a couple of whack things can seriously damper the experience or your enjoyment of this one but overall the pace is pretty consistent throughout and he's by no means the best but another pretty damn good main boss that's very well done in Elden Ring Morgat is the second, or I guess rather third, appearance of Margit. There is a spot in the game where he's just a normal enemy in Altus Plateau, which is really weird to be honest, but in any case, Morgat has some key distinctions that make him a totally different boss than Margit to handle. The tarnished who gets no bitches and stacks no paper. Firstly, he has much more tools and active moves to work with. There's much more space in this arena as well, thus he moves around a lot more. And he also has a second phase switch up. The things I really enjoy about Morgoth are the fact that he feels like he's testing everything you learned since Margit up to that point and on how much you've improved both as a literal player and as well as your character. He still works on the same principles, you know, he's meant to test your timing, catch panic rolling, etc. But this time with a few new tricks up his sleeve. 
He also is pretty good in clear animations when trying to know what's punishable and what isn't. Not perfect ones, mind you, but they are pretty stellar. This fight can also feel incredibly rewarding to learn as you keep playing. You can absolutely feel yourself getting better and better with each attempt. However, some of his moves still do feel overly windy, really unnatural, and just have odd timing for no real reason other than to catch you pushing buttons or something dumb. And, you know, you learn it a couple times, not because it goes with the flow of the fight, but just because that that's how they programmed it. And the worst thing of all, the amount of buttons that this man can push without taking a break is beyond absurd. Like, he starts combos, and I, I could go and get a whole university degree, but before he's done with his combo moves. Alright, we'll do this quick and easy. Bro, I really got hit by that? Throwing out a lot of moves, man. I gotta do something. And here he goes. Alright, this is gonna be a little while. Now we got some time to kill, and I got a lot of stuff I need to do. In the workforces of many of the advanced democracies that have been... how every one of us is called on to adapt throughout our lives. All right, it's been a while. He should finally be done with this combo. Finally, there's an opening. But all in all though, I think Morgoth is an enhanced and maybe slightly more interesting Margit. I know it's not the best designed and Morgoth does have a few issues, but personally it's one of the more enjoyable fights to me in my opinion and I always have a great time playing it. Now, my brother in Christ, let me shoot straight with you on this. Uh, the Fire Giant is essentially the epitome of the dullness of the snowy region itself. It's conceptually a lot like the Radon fight in terms of scale, just with way less attention to detail and style. The scale of the arena, like I said, is pretty similar. Uh, it's an actual oversized giant enemy, and you do have access to Torrent, so they are similar in that sense, but Fire Giant basically just moves in these really long motions very frequently, so you're always chasing him down throughout the fight. Radon's a bit more erratic, but generally stays engaged in combat. Fire Giant plays a lot more like of, of a retreat sort of play, and in Fire Giant's second phase, he pretty much loses all vulnerable spots. He has like one right on the back of his ankle in phase one, but that's really it. You kind of just have to chip away at him over and over again until he reaches zero. This fight, I actually found to be one of the easiest in the game upon repeat playthroughs. His moves are basically all or nothing. If you get hit by something in phase one or two, it's likely game over almost right away, but they're quite telegraphed and easy to react to. Main problem with Fire Giant is, like, sure, he works as intended, I just find him so insufferably boring and dull, which is odd considering this boss is the conclusion of the entire open world format and second act. Not the biggest fan of Fire Giant, but he's alright, I suppose. Oh my god, I really have to talk about this fight, don't I? Lord forgive me, as I'm about to have a gamer moment. Honestly, I feel like I've been pretty nice and fair to the Elden Ring bosses so far. You know, while I have my critiques of them, there is no boss in Elden Ring that I despise more than the Godskin Duo. And it's beyond me how anyone thought players were gonna enjoy this boring trash. Now, let me be clear, I really like both the Godskin Noble and the Apostle on their own. In their individual encounters, they're usually pretty okay, but putting them together in one fight goes together worse than EDP 445 and Cupcakes. And if you don't get that reference, good, that's probably for the best. So, in the Godskin Duo fight, you take on Ben Affleck from a Marvel movie and a fat ass. But let's think about this for a second though. Typically, any duo boss fight in a game is essentially one entity or boss that's split into two. Throwing two fully capable bosses at the player is so clearly unfair, even FromSoft would know, you know, to account for this. And in prior games, they've done, you know, fights like the Ornstein and Smo fight, which was actually relatively balanced and very similar in its conception to this fight. However, it's like with Godskin Duo, they forgot to take their brain medication 
dedication and, you know, forgot all the principles that make a fight like this work. Or even in other video games entirely, you know, one boss is generally split into two things. That's like very simple concept. Games have done that forever. And they have largely different attributes in terms of speed and power. Or they have strengths that cover the the other's vulnerability and etc. Once again, great example is the Ornstein and Smo fight in Dark Souls 3. And that's a good example of how to do a concept like this. It's also like, like Pyra and Mithra in Smash Brothers. Mithra is super fast and agile, but lighter and does way less damage. Pyra is way slower than Mithra, but she's a bit heavier and she hits like my ex-wife. You know, that's just typically the concept that games like to go for, but instead of cutesy anime girls, the Gotskin duo are old, decrepit, disgusting men with no clear attribute differences. In fact, the big man himself is, like, faster than the Squidward-looking fellow. Anything you think is punishable is immediately struck down as the other one will guard the recovery window. And if you do happen to get a punish in, especially on the big one, he'll do this almost unreactable belly move that causes you to trade hits so much. The fact that they move at basically the same speed makes them such a nightmare to deal with. It's not like you can really split them up and take them one on one. Oh, oh, and let's say you do happen to kill one. They pull from the same health bar, so they'll just respawn after a few seconds. And let's say you kill both at the same time. You know, you, you would think you would get rewarded for that, you know, for playing optimally. Nothing happens, though. You're sat there awkwardly waiting for them to come back, and it doesn't the reward the player whatsoever for doing this at all. Not to mention the giant rolly fat move that Fat Albert over here can do. Technically, you can roll through this, but it's far too risky and inconsistent. And you're just, I guess, supposed to use the pillars to block them until it's over and just pray to God that the AI doesn't slip past it or that the other one gets too aggressive while you're waiting. And if you get them below half health they just go sicko mode and run you down so that you can't even position yourself to retaliate with anything if you wanted to my god it's just so bad and boring this is the only boss in encounter in the game that i genuinely dread and i really don't think it's just a massive case of skill issue it's almost universally agreed upon that this fight is cringe it's just not good or engaging design for a boss fight and you'd think this be a bit closer tuned and examined since it's a literal mandatory boss to beat the game, but this is easily the most unfair and sloppy boss fight in Elden Ring by a country mile. And I was thinking about it, I'm like, how could you improve the Godskin duo fight? And I was like, you know what, you know what would be really funny? If in the Godskin duo fight, you could with one of the and then you could and then it'd be even faster. Next up is the good old beast clergyman who then becomes later Malekith the Black Blade, a fight that can be a little controversial and isn't without its faults, but I think is still relatively fun and solid. We'll start with the beast clergyman, and this is his initial form in which he plays a lot more grounded and in a rushdown kind of behavior. His threat range and damage aren't anything insane, but he throws out a lot of attacks and has very little cooldown. This can make it a little deceiving to know when something is actually safe to punish. That, on top of him blatantly reading your controller's inputs and dodging the very second you push a button, you know, to hit something you think is open, and then he just does this move where he chucks rocks at you while putting some space in between you and him. That can be extremely annoying. I do think it's kind of ridiculous how many hitboxes he can throw out in succession and not be punished for it, but his moves are telegraphed and reactable enough. I'm aware a lot of people don't like Beast Clergyman, and I think that's totally fair, but personally, I happen to really enjoy this fight a lot for the most part. It probably depends greatly on the build you're using, since Beast Clergyman is rushed down when he gets to half HP, of course, and he changes to Malekith, he becomes the exact opposite, which is really frustrating. Melee excels against his first phase, but really struggles against Malekith. Malekith is very airborne, acrobatic, and hardly vulnerable for any real time at all. It's definitely doable with a melee build, you just have to wait for a ton of dangerous attacks to wrap up. But clearly, you are meant to play this fight with the Blasphemous Claw item. This heavily stuns Malekith on moves where his sword is glowing yellow, but if you don't have this item or don't know what it does, then good luck. But even if you do, it's by no means obvious how you're supposed to use it. I typically don't bother with this item, but apparently, using this makes Malekith a completely different fight and significantly more bearable for melee builds and just in general. I don't love the implementation of this, but both Beast Clergyman and Malekith are still very high tier bosses for me in this game. 
For this next one, I was wondering if I even consider Sir Gideon Offenir a main boss in Elden Ring, but I suppose since he is mandatory and he has some interesting mechanics and properties, he's worth discussing. The thing about his moveset is that he's really all magic based, and this ends up meaning that if you respect his moves too much, he's just going to keep you boxed out and get momentum. If you let bro cook for too long, he just gets going and this will eventually drown you out and overwhelm the player with magic. The key to success in this fight is just completely disrespectful respecting any button he pushes right as it begins. Just simply reacting to anything he does and preventing it is the easiest way to win this boss fight. He's not super complex or intricate, he only has a handful of moves to deal with anyways, but I really think he's a nice change of pace coming after the exhausting and embarrassing godskin duo and the relative difficulty of Malekith. It's a decently fun fight for what it is that just requires a certain level of confidence to really bring it home consistently. Walk just 100 feet up the stairs after defeating Sir Gideon and you're gonna run into Godfrey first Elden Lord. Now technically this isn't the first time we see this homie as we did fight him in the capital as the golden shade version of Godfrey and also uh, without his persona. <laughs> But the actual Godfrey fight near the end is a bit of an odd one. He also has two phases, Godfrey and Horalu. I really like the Godfrey fight significantly more. His moves are devastating, but they have learnable combos and clearly punishable windows. This fight is, you know, very give and take, and I feel like you get greatly rewarded for playing this one well and making the right decisions. It feels like it's very much in your favor and you have agency. Unfortunately, both him and Horalu have some crazy and almost comically long windups on a bunch of their moves and it just looks goofy and unnatural at times especially in phase two horlu is easily exploitable has some unbelievably annoying moves and just isn't nearly as fun or engaging as godfrey i mean you do fight him in the same arena as morgoth the elden throne which is cool you know you've been in here before but to me this fight ends up being just sort of average a lot of people find this boss fight to be anticlimactic or just somewhat underwhelming considering it's the fight before the literal end end of the game, it's leaves something to be desired and I really do agree with that. At some point, we had to get around to talking about her. Easily the most difficult and potentially controversial boss fight in all of Elden Ring, Melania, Blade of Mikola, is very special because she's quite out of the way to get to to begin with. She's not a mandatory boss and you really need to jump through a lot of hoops to fight her anyways. But here's the thing. I really like Melenia as a boss. She's one of my favorite in the game, uh, but I cannot honestly say that FromSoft didn't go too far in a few places. I get the whole idea of wanting to make one boss in the game a clear notch above virtually anything else difficulty-wise and make it interesting, but Melenia starts to cross the line of what is considered to be fair or balanced very heavily. Melania has essentially two main mechanics that make her an absolute menace to deal with. The first is lifesteal, so every time she lands a hit on you, she gets some of her life back. This wouldn't be so bad if there was ways to really counteract this across all builds. Like, for example, and I don't understand this at all, blocking Melania's attacks with a shield still grants her HP back and puts you at risk of getting your guard broken. There is no point in using a shield that, you know, you may have spent the entire game leveling up. Also, life still works even when you trade hits. And secondly, her other mechanic is she turns into Sephiroth and starts using Octa Slash. It's called Waterfowl Dance, but it's easier to say and it's basically the same thing. And the thing is, in phase one, Melania will typically do an Octa Slash twice, before and after you get her below 50% health. The thing is, in most cases, Octa Slash is pretty much Melania just choosing to win the game. And if you don't start running away the very frame that it starts up, you're pretty much not getting out of it. And remember, of course, she gets health back from this. And in phase two, Melania will just Octa Slash at any point she wants. No rhyme or reason for it at all. It's not predictable, and it, you're at the mercy of the AI. In my opinion, this is a little too much. I think giving her lifesteal or Octa Slash is fair, not both. Also, not to mention, this fight does reward you, you know, with punishing her aggression. She can be easily hit stunned, but she also has super armor on a ton of moves that even if you successfully punish something you were going to get hit by and, you know, you deflected that, you're going to get hit with the next one or an Octa Slash since you got too close and you now don't have time to run away. I understand a lot of people will literally just say skill issue bro, have a bigger brain and just get better, but it's like this fight's optimal amount of challenge without feeling unnecessarily unfair just really isn't there. 
I love this fight in almost all other aspects. I just think it's a little too far over the top, and there's some stuff I just can't defend. It's a challenge, sure, but one where you're praying the AI is merciful on you and doesn't octa slash too much, or just praying you don't get hit by it, even if she does. Those are my major issues with Melania. I mean, she is a solid boss, but it's clear they can't help themselves and show a little restraint when making her, which is not a compliment. All in all, a fun boss, but a good example of just going a little bit too far in the extreme direction just for the sake of it, and it's not for the best in my opinion. Now, the final main boss battle in Elden Ring is a two-parter against Radagon and then Elden Beast. I think the fact that you have to beat both in succession really hurts this one, but I'll get to that. I'm just going to say it, Radagon is easily one of the best bosses in Elden Ring in my opinion, maybe even my favorite on a good day. Elden Beast, not so much, and I, I could be wrong here, but I think the thought process behind this boss duo was that you have the mechanically interesting and intricate boss fight in Radagon. Sure, the visuals aren't anything spectacular, it's actually kind of an ugly looking arena, but mechanically, the fight is incredible. Then, you get to Elden Beast, which is the total opposite, a grand visual spectacle, but mechanically very dull and slow. I suppose I get the approach for that, but realistically, its execution has some holes. I'll begin with Radagon. Now, what I really love about this fight is how the flow and dance is established right away. His animations are so crisp and, and well done that telegraphing his moves never feels too one-sided or unfair. Now, Radagon can push a lot of buttons, which is, you know, can be a problem. It's the same issue that a lot of Elden Ring bosses have. He drains your resources before you get to Elden Beast at all, which is probably the biggest detriment as it relates to him specifically. But finding the rhythm of this fight and finding the right way to respond to each move is just so satisfying. There's a few moves that just drive me crazy, though, like the wind-up on his grab or whatever just looks so stupid and it has that just overly delayed wind up that I, I'm so over and also the punish opportunities of some of the moves he can do this like single golden ray that comes out so fast it's debatable whether you can even avoid this consistently or not it doesn't do a ton of damage but still that can be frustrating but in any case Radagon's fight still feels like a consistent dance and a give and take where precision and good timing is greatly rewarded such a mechanically excellent fight but the problem is once you beat that, you go on to Elden Beast, and this one I don't have quite as much praise for. This is gonna sound kind of funny, but one of the core issues for me is the literal design of this character. I get it's supposed to be the amalgamation of chaos and the unknown incarnate in monster form, but to me, Elden Beast isn't scary or intimidating looking. In fact, it's kind of the opposite, like, it's, it's kind of cute. It looks like a, a squishy fish kind of animal with its, like, adorable little one eye. I don't really get unknown terror vibes from this one, more just, like, squishy space fish. And the cuteness holds Elden Beast back from being as grandiose as he probably should be. But the, the visuals are where the problems just begin. This fight and pacing is a slow and boring disaster. The amount of running and waiting you need to do back and forth in the arena just grinds the pace of combat to a near halt. The moment you successfully ev evade a sequence of moves, you should get rewarded for that and, you know, get in striking distance, and as soon as you do, he just goes away to the other side. Elden Beast to me feels much like a test of skill, more so a test of patience, since the fight is unbearably slow, and you need to keep beating Radagon to get here if you fail. I don't know if I really want to call Elden Beast a bad fight, it's just clearly got some gaps and flaws. There's a theory that Torrent was supposed to be usable in this fight, similar to how it was in Radon and the Fire Giant, but for whatever reason, this just isn't the case. Even Elden Beast's moveset feels like it was compatible for play with Torrent. He's got this one move called like Elden Stars or whatever where these things come out and it's pretty much unavoidable damage. Probably won't kill you, but you know, it feels like you should be able to avoid this in somehow. And then also this giant ring, this feels like you need Torrent to jump over it or not need him, but you know what I mean. It feels like you should be able to have this. Basically, everything in this fight screams at me that something else needed. There was another component that was supposed to be in this fight that just isn't at play. So it just really feels like something's missing. But whatever the case may be, Elden Beast is still somewhat anticlimactic as a boss fight, both visually and mechanically in my eyes. The first time you beat Elden Beast is sure to be a rush, but upon replaying it, you can really feel the hollowness of the design of, you know, this particular ending. 
Needless to say, there's countless other bosses in Elden Ring, all with their own different variants, appearances, mechanics, and abilities. Given the insane range of Elden Ring's boss variety, the game is still too big to effectively use them all without having a bunch of copy-paste repeats. The world scale and size was maybe just a little overzealous in comparison to the enemy variety they could realistically include in it. But again, as I stated earlier, I think this is largely a problem for people who take the game a bit more seriously than the average gamer. You know, most people may not even notice these issues, to be honest, but for me personally, the bosses have so much depth and variety that I can deal with some repeats or a few of the less fun ones occasionally. It's extremely clear that many of these more minor bosses in the game didn't get the love or attention to detail that the more integral ones got, but, you know, that's to be expected. They had to save on dev time and everything, and I can understand why that was the case. For being the main selling point of the game in a way, all in all, the bosses are still easily the most charming part of Elden Ring and will remain iconic and enjoyable for decades to come. I am absolutely sure of it. Elden Ring as a total experience is completely impossible to encapsulate in just one YouTube video. You have an actual very fresh and new innovative take on what it means to be an open world game, and I guarantee will change the direction of that genre of games forever going forward. It will be always be regarded as one of those innovative games of our generation, and while not perfect, once again, the amount of value you get out of that aspect alone makes Elden Ring arguably worth the price tag and then some, but then on top of the massive boss variety, the technical and mechanical beauty of them, and the game's sheer style and aesthetic, Elden Ring shifted the landscape of gaming for good. A title of this magnitude is going to have its faults, its shortcomings, or otherwise personal gripes you may experience, but putting this experience into perspective with some of the other awful trash that gets released with the exact same price tag is almost unreal. I really do believe that despite all the criticisms I and many others have for the title itself, its imperfections are part of the experience. Elden Ring came out at a time where games were in desperate need of a refresher, and this was so novel and different to the palette, which is why I think it captured everyone's attention in the way that it did. Mark my words, 5-10 to ten years from now, people are going to look at Elden Ring with such reverence and nostalgia, and with that, you'll know what kind of impact it had on them after first experiencing Elden Ring in its complete and masterful form.